Welcome to How to Rock the Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Von Trigger. Welcome back to Rock the Stage Show. Welcome back on another Sunday night. I'm glad you're taking time to join us because we're in for a fun one tonight. I get to go back to my sports broadcasting play-by-play days for, 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 for just a little bit tonight. We can go back to the world of baseball, have a little fun there. But the bigger topic tonight is, and think about this, life often throws us all curves. What do you do with that? How do you handle when life hits you with things that completely destroy the natural flow and the trajectory of your life? Tonight, we're going to sit down and have a conversation with the former professional baseball players who had to face that hard truth. It happened to him, but what he has done to go forward is absolutely amazing. You're going to hear a great story tonight and get deep inside the conversation. We do want to thank our sponsors for making it all possible here. Of course, Adavita Studios. Adavita Studios is a, an award-winning audio production and podcasting organization. They'll take your audio book, your podcast series, distribute it to the market even wider, and Adavita will connect your voice to the world. Learn more at adavita.com. And Suspiciously Convenient Productions is once this, back once again as our sponsor. Again, they're located over the border in Canada, but they're helping you produce your film and TV series. If you're an author, if you're a writer, if you have a dream to take a product and bring it to life on film, you want to reach out to Suspiciously Convenient Productions, and they will help you bring that dream to life. But tonight, we're back to Rock the Stage Show, and it's going to be a fun one to connect life, sports, disaster, and dare I say resurrection, and a powerful way to help other people to learn all these life lessons. We're going to get into a great conversation here today. And Chris Fasami is with us. He is a speaker, a nutritionist, a hitting coach. He leads and helps people in their relentless pursuit of peak performance. He's also a cancer warrior, a former professional baseball player with the Colorado Rockies organization, and he's a big dude, six foot four, 230 pounds. Let's welcome Chris into the studio tonight. Chris, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Rich. I really appreciate you being here. You know, I, I was checking you out, watching some other interviews, and you did mention you are a towering force. What was that like to have that through your collegiate career, your baseball career? You, you are a powerful, strong man stepping up to the plate. It was always a gift. You know, it's they always say there's two things that you can't really teach and it's size and speed. And um, I can say I did not have the latter. So I always said that, you know, uh, for me to end up on second base, I had to hit a lot of doubles because I wasn't going to hit. There's no way I was getting a single and then stealing a base. So you got to know what your strengths are. You got to know what your weaknesses are. And hopefully your weaknesses come out a little bit less than than you would hope. When, 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 when you're a bigger towering guy like that and your growth spurt, I'm sure it was probably rapid through your teen years. There's not a lot you can do. It's either basketball or football or be a goalie that beats the daylights out of people. Right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, especially as I've gotten older and see more of the, the sports world, you know, I would have loved to have been a soccer goalie. Those are some big dudes, hockey goalie. Those are some big dudes. So, yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, growing up watching pro wrestling, you know, Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, these were these were people that you aspired to be. So before we give it all away, you're a big towering guy and then cancer hits your life. Mm -hmm. And the big towering guy isn't so big anymore, is he? No. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I tell people all the time that for all the pride and ego that I had as a professional baseball player, Cancer took that away real fast. You know, being able to be totally in control of your your life, your career, what goes in your body, the work ethic, the time you spend, that all goes away when you hear the words, I'm sorry, Christopher, you have cancer. And then all of a sudden now you you take this very backseat passive approach because you're just waiting for doctors and science and medicine to help you, which some did. Um, 
and some didn't, which we can get into. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just pride and ego is gone because essentially it's going to do whatever it wants. So you kind of have to, you know, for, for as proactive as you want to be, there's always going to be this this playing defense. And you've now turned that, though, into, and again, I love the phrase, how do you hit home runs when cancer is the pitcher? Mm-hmm. You, you literally have decided to say, screw it. I'm not done yet, right? That's right. I mean, I, I really do. I've, it, it's taken time to develop this. You know, the first two years of my diagnosis, I was absolutely the token victim, you know, sitting on the couch, pint of ice cream in between my legs, crying, woe is me, all this stuff, you know, watching a commercial being like, why can't I stop crying? All the while, you know, trying to sit there and figure out like, what, what can I actually do? And so, you know, over the past five years, it's developed, you know, a mindset of, I truly believe I live a life of dichotomy where I live my life as if I'm not sick, but I know I am sick. And so hopefully I've done enough things on the sunny days so that when the storm hits, you know, I can maybe sleep a little bit calmer. So let's rewind the tape now that we've got people kind of sitting on the edge of the seat and saying, what the heck? Baseball, college baseball, Notre Dame. I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana, 30 mm-hmm. minutes from the Dome. Yeah. And from ND. That's a big school. That's a big sports school. The history is so rich everywhere you go at Notre Dame, and you get the opportunity to go there. What was it like to go from high school to Notre Dame? It was, you know, everything you thought it was a B. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm an Italian Catholic, Irish Irish Italian Catholic from New York. So being able to step on that campus and go to a school like that and with all the tradition and the excellence that comes with it. It was one of those things where you really had to rise to the occasion. And so I loved it. I, I enjoyed it. I made some good friends there. Um, you know, my coach and I, we didn't agree on my future. I learned a lot from him, but I wanted to hit. They wanted me to just be a pitcher. So I ended up transferring to Elon University down here in North Carolina. Um, yeah. And, you know, ended up being able to work and, and get drafted as a hitter eventually. So I've been in the baseball field as part of my broadcasting career. I've worked on the management side as well. What's it like for you as the athlete when management coach sits you down and says, we see you here and your heart goes, I see me here. What's that conversation like? Because very few people talk about that moment when it's a closed door conversation, they try to redirect you. What's it like? At the end of the day, life's about chances. And we were number two in the country when I was there. So as a freshman, being on, a, on the number two team in the country, just to give you some context, yeah. off of that roster of 30 guys, 24 of us ended up getting drafted. So a very talented group of men. And the guy who was playing first base ended up getting drafted. So I didn't expect to play a lot. I ended up pitching a good amount that year. But I got one at bat. And so... For somebody to tell me who this just a year prior, I'm an all-American, I'm a top one of the top 10 hitters in the country. For someone to tell me after one chance that I'll never hit in college, unfortunately, that's just not something that I'm I'm prepared to to accept. And so sure. to walk out of that office and say, man, I, I have to I have to transfer from the University of Notre Dame, that's that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. But at the same time, my goal and my dream was still to play professional baseball. So my there's no choice to stop playing baseball to stay at Notre Dame. That was never even a consideration. Well, growing up in the upper Midwest, being with baseball as long as I was, and you, you, you know, this baseball season, in the upper Midwest is way tinier Very than being in the Southern league. Did that help your career to make the shift from North to South? It did. I mean, look at, at, at schools like Notre Dame and Michigan facilities are not a problem. But there is something to be said for being able to be outside in the sunshine, on the grass, as early as January. I mean, it really is something that you really don't truly get and you don't understand until you actually do it. So, yeah, the ability to to get outside, play more ball. And now that I'm down here in Charlotte, North Carolina, full time, you really just you just see it. I mean, it's really just it's a beautiful environment to really grow and develop as an athlete. And when you do swing the bat in the upper Midwest in that first game in March or late April, 
the bat really hums in your hand, doesn't it? There's, oh, a, cold, there's a feeling that's painful. <laughs> Absolutely. And that never goes away. <laughs> it does not go away. You know, the other thing people don't talk about, and I saw firsthand, the grind of baseball. People do not understand what it does to your body. You, you eat, drink, sleep, get on bad buses, eat bad food. You're eating at the hot dogs at the stadium after the game. All these things that go into it. And then there's the grind of a very long season. What's it like to add that to the fact, the cancer and everything else? Were you able to play it all at the beginning of the cancer battle? Or did, did it stop everything because the hall is so consuming? You know, it's interesting the overarching bubble theme is grinding. Yeah. And you just kind of learn how to do it. And, and what, you know, and a lot of times I call them my four G's and it's kind of, you know, my, what I live by on a daily basis, it's grind, grit, grace, and gratitude. So I, I'm going to hit all four of those G's every single day. And I just believe that without, without grit, there is no grind. And so being able to just kind of understand what's in front of you, but not get too far ahead, not dwell on the past, just kind of really take each day for what it is. Being able to, to have that set of standards that you want to live by and, and kind of have that discipline that you're, you're willing to do, not four out of seven days, not five out of seven days, six to seven days a week, 26 to you know 28 out of 30 days a month, month over month. That's where the grind really comes in. And don't get me wrong. There's so many people who sit there and go, oh, that's that's so negative. That's such a downer. It's like, no, it's just it is what it is. And when you are grinding, you can you you have the ability to take a step back and, and be content and be happy and, and find these these amazing moments of joy. And I just believe that without one, you can't have the other. Bullseye. Again, put a pin on it, everybody. <laughs> Make sure you remember that because you do. You have to find those windows. And you have to breathe it in, take it in, because that refuels you for the next grind, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, this, it's not easy. Like, no, no one said life is easy. And, and, and I think it's on the contrary. Like, if, if your life is full of fluff, then I don't believe you're leading a, a true whole life. And we try to choose our life. This is something I had to learn. We try to choose our life, our destiny, our path. And often life chooses it for you. And it's that defining moment of what am I going to do? Am I going to choose to live, grind it out? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to choose to play the victim and say, it didn't work out. I guess I'm done. Right. How, how can you help other people understand that defining moment of literally I'm going to move or I'm going to die? Maybe not physically die, but you are going to die. Walk us through. How can you help other people understand the, that moment? So the moment for me was probably about after two years, I two and a half years, I my first daughter had just been born. And so here we are, 10 months in to her birth, and I'm, you know, two and a half years into my journey, my health journey. And because I had thyroid cancer, you know, my first surgery of multiple surgeries, I had my whole thyroid taken out. So just living with that change was something that I wasn't prepared for, nor did anybody prepare it for me. Now, here I am. I'm, I'm on medicine now for the rest of my life. And really, it's to the point where if the medicine doesn't work, I don't work. It can be pretty robotic at times. And the problem is that when it doesn't work, too many things go off the rails. And so here I am and, and I'm, you know, I should be enjoying these moments of my daughter and her growth and her development and just this pure joy and innocence. And I was, but at the same time, I want to kill myself because just my hormones were so out of whack mentally, physically. So out of whack, you know, anxiety through the roof, depression, just highs and lows. And so I ended up the day after Thanksgiving, going into the hospital for a couple of days because I went in with what's called a thyroid storm, where basically, if you were to go get your your TSH checked right now, your thyroid stimulating hormone, you know, a good working thyroid is between zero and three, zero and four. You start creeping up above four into the high single digits teens, it can get alarming. 
because it means that everything's low functioning. Things are not happening the way they're supposed to. I walked in the day at that hospital with a 99 TSH. And I sat there and they laid me down and they gave me some medicine and I went to sleep and I woke up and the doctors literally looked at me and said, Chris, I don't know how you walked in here. I have no clue. And so I ended up leaving the hospital, but I was just really, it was just, it was different. Everything up to that point had just manifested very physically. This was different. This was mental. This was emotional. You know, I, I, I was a professional baseball player. I would get up to bat in front of 10, 15,000 people who wanted to see me fail. And it, I never lost a night of sleep. And now here I am. I have one bad thought and I spiral for four days. Like there's just something not right. Yes. And so I remember a couple weeks later, I was walking down the street and it just kind of had this moment where... I ended up taking my shoes off and walking barefoot through the street. And it was the first time that I had felt like grounded and felt alive. And it felt like things were real and I had any sense of control. And so I remember feeling the gravel underneath my feet. And it was the first time that I could hear the leaves blowing in the trees and I, I could hear birds and I could feel the sunshine. And I was like, man, like you got a lot of chances. Like you, you could, I mean, you should be gone. Maybe you'd be dead. Like, but you, you haven't, you've, you've given, you've got some grace and you've got some chances. So it's time to switch it up. And so I really went into, you know, going back to understanding what I was really in control of on a daily basis, which is my decisions, my reactions and my preparation. Ah. And, you know, ever since then, that's, that's what it's taken for me. And that's what it is on a daily basis. You know, I, I, I call them my non-negotiables. And I tell people, you got to figure out what your non-negotiables are on a daily basis. And you have to figure out what's your why. And you got to figure out your purpose. And you got to put yeah. purpose to your pain and suffering to be able to get to the other side of it. And being able to lump all that stuff together and being able to help somebody come to these realizations is, is for me what it's all about. And being able to find these micro habits of whether it be physical, mental, emotional, and, and, you know, more specifically that, that mindset and that perspective shift to be able to sit there and say, look, if I've woken up today, I have a chance and hope is a really powerful thing. <laughs> it is. There is so much of your story, literally words you said that overlay exactly with my own journey. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's, it's powerful. Many people don't understand that whole concept of I'm choosing today to get out of bed or I'm choosing to stay in bed or take it easy because my body needs this. I'm choosing the right choice today. Tomorrow could be totally different. And we're used to trying to plan our calendars and our weeks and our dates out. And you and I both know there's today. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the hour. Was that hard for you and your family to adjust that dad, husband, we need to allow him to be in that space, to give him the grace and the room to do what's best for him today, now? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a learning curve for all of us, for sure. I can honestly say that there's really hasn't been a morning in seven years where I jumped out of bed in the morning. I'm, you know, <laughs> there's no... Not, none of that. I mean, it is a constant conversation to get going. Let's go. Three, two, one, get out of bed. Three, two, one, put your shoes on. And it, I mean, and it is. And people laugh. I say, but, yeah. but it works. And so there are times where, yes, you know, look, I'm 38 years old. I got diagnosed when I was 31. I was two and a half years into my marriage. To say that we were the best communicators, we would be a lie. So we thought we were good communicators, and then things happen. And so you're constantly developing your communi communication skills with people I train, people I work with, my spouse, my wife. Even there are times where my daughters are five and three. There's times where I just kind of snap on them, and it's I got to apologize right away because it has nothing to do with them. Nothing. And it's, Nothing. And it, but it's, it's learning all those things and it's a product of this. And I, you know, a couple of years ago, I put up a post basically thanking cancer because albeit there's so many things that have gone wrong 
but there's so many more things that have gone right. Well, and, and I, finding I, that purpose, finding that purpose for the pain, as you said, mm -hmm. you're going to fight to the pain because you know you have a purpose. Yep. So which one drove what? Did the purpose drive you to go after the purpose or did the pain drive you to go after the purpose? I reached the point where I finally felt like my head was above water. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that for all those years, I had been ebbing and flowing, but it was always below the surface. So what felt like a win was not a total win. But over these last, you know, over this last year, especially, I feel like my head's above water. And Rich, I will do anything it takes to never go below the water again, bro. Like the please darkness is that. real. Please. You know? People are living below the line most of life. They're they're walking blind. They're walking zombie. We don't realize how much we're living below until we experience what you and I have, where you do start living above, don't you? Yeah. And I mean, look, the darkness is real. Whatever it be, the you know the trauma you go through, the the PTSD, the things that happen. I mean that that, that trauma is real, and the darkness is real. But when you understand the darkness and you actually can figure out how to learn from it instead of run from it, all these opportunities for growth and and evolution really start to happen. Now you're also a nutrition coach. Did that come out of everything you went through? And you said, yes. you know what? I got the I got to get my body right, and I want to help yeah. other people get their body right. Well, again, like I said, I waited for doctors and science and medicine to work, and I I I got worse, and I gained sixty pounds while waiting. And so now, then it was taking the weight off, and then now, you know, I I I have a credo that I like to live by. It's called shock your doctors, and so I'm just constantly trying to shock my doctors, and do things that that the that the Chris who ends up on the piece of paper after the lab report says he can't do. So I'm I'm going to do it. And that's where it kind of came from, where I was doing these things where the doctors were like, how do you do this? 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 How do you thrive with, with chronic thyroid disease? How do you thrive with cancer? How do you do it? How do you do it? And I was like, I'll show you. And I'm happy to coach it. And I'm happy to do it. You know, So I, I got to be able to take all my, my love of coaching and all the experience I've gotten over the years training players and now bring it to you know, the general population. Shock your doctor. That may be the title of this episode. We may rebrand the couple <laughs> called Shock Your Doctor. I absolutely love that mindset of like, I dare you to tell me I can't. Just, 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 just watch me. Those are the things that, again, through my experience, through your experience, sounds like of you, you're just driven to, to take it further and faster because you know that's going to help you keep moving next day and the next day and the next day. Yeah, because the virtue is in the work, Rich. Yes. It's not about the result. You know, luckily for all of us, the result's the same. We're, we're all going to die. So now it's about, like, take that off the table. So now, what are you willing to do on a daily basis to see how much you can get out of this life? Yes. Squeeze every day. Now, I also know you do still work with athletes. You yes. coach them. But I'm, I'm guessing you're not just doing the sports coaching. You're life coaching while you're coaching sport. I'm betting that, right? Yes. We meet under the precipice that I'm going to teach somebody how to be really good at swinging a bat and being the best hitter they can possibly be. But after about six months, it really starts about life and mentorship and helping, you know, boys and girls, you know, turn into young adults, go through their high school years and just be able to, you know, have the right mindset and, and understand that you'll get everything you want through hard work. And you'll get it by doing more than somebody else. And we all have choices to what you said before. We all have choices to make. And, and the younger at of age you can learn that, the more empowered you'll be. So through that journey, the kids will learn the skill of sports and baseball. There's a life, a shelf life on that. Mm -hmm. The average baseball player, as you get to the pros, which you got selected by the Colorado Rockies, you were in the organization the average to get to the big leagues, once you're in the minor leagues, takes seven to nine years, I know. Yeah. That's a grind right there in itself. You have to be dedicated to that. So when you work with these young athletes, are you helping them understand it's love the game more than just trying to be a pro because the people that get there are a tiny group of people, and honestly, they don't last long. No, and I think the problem, too, is that it becomes an identity crisis at some point. And we attach our identity to results yeah. and we attach our identity to 
wins and we attach our identity to batting averages and home runs and and you know look i say it all the time people ask me you know what drove you i go i loved having my name in the newspaper loved it like if we won it would be the headline if we lost somewhere in there it was going to say chris wasami in a losing effort was three for four with three doubles like but it's again you still have to separate it at some point because one day it's going to be over the 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 be the, the the ability to be an athlete and continue to play, it's going to be over. So now when that happens, if you don't extrapolate the fact that you have value, you have worth, you have hard work, you have discipline, you have the ability to deal with failure and the ability to bring all those things and now package it into the person that you are going to become for the rest of your life, then it was all for nothing. And too many athletes waited till after the lights were off to figure out what you just said. You're now coming in before that mm-hmm. while they're still swinging, while they're still learning the skills you're making it into them now. So when that does come, they've already been told up front and prepared for it. I, I, th- I think that's powerful and huge what you're doing for them now, but what you're doing for the future. Yeah. And I mean, look, it's when I started doing this, you know, I gave my first lesson 19 years ago while I was still in college to say that the generations have changed and the outside influences have changed would be an understatement. Yeah. And so now not only are you dealing with comparing yourself to the person next to you, but now because of Twitter and social media and Instagram and Facebook and all this stuff, I can compare myself to anybody anywhere. Instantaneously. Instantaneously. And you get this, this almost this, wrong sense of self because you're getting praise for things that are really not that big a deal. It It, used to be the back of the bubblegum card. Remember we go by those, we look at the stats. Now it's online right now, as you're swinging the bat in a lot of collegiate leagues, your stats are live in the moment. Absolutely. There's no way to really face that, is there? There's there's no way to compete with that. No, which is why you have to you have to give people, and and in this case, young adults, the tools to be able to wrap their head around and 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 with logic and rationale, be like, all right, you know what? Cool. Like today, I was three for three. Tomorrow, I have the same chance of going zero for three. But it's about the approach. And when you go back to the cancer struggle. I know from my own liver struggle and the decline that I went through, again, I'd get up and I'd swing for the fences every day. I would try really hard. There were days I can remember working with my brother, painting the back of his house, and I could have painted that back wall as a healthy guy in a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. I'm on a one-quarter panel, and I am shot. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell myself, that's a home run. Because I got up, I made the move, I worked with my brother, we got some of it done. And he said, go take a break and come back when you're okay, when you when you're re-energized tomorrow, whenever, and we'll finish this wall. Learning that that's a home run for people is a massive leap of life lesson, isn't it? Life is about moving dirt, Rich. And some days we wake up and we have a shovel, and some days we have a teaspoon. And but you still got to move the dirt. And the, the idea is that just because you wake up that day and you have low energy and you don't feel good and it's not the best day and everything's not perfect, it doesn't mean that you don't get to show up for work. You've got to constantly show up for yourself. You have to. Now, what's the Exit Velocity program? So that's a program that I put together a couple of years ago for – you know, young kids who were looking for a reason, you know, to, to work out, maybe didn't have the program. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, a, it's, it gives everybody a really good template for about 12 weeks to get stronger, get faster, get some hitting drills in. And the idea is that by getting stronger and having a more efficient swing, you hit the ball harder, which increases your exit velocity, which is a metric that we use today. How, how much has all that changed? And do kids really want to learn these skills? Because, again, they watch ESPN. They watch all this stuff. It looks so easy. But, you know, it's reps. It's batting cages. It's all these things. Are, are, is, is the younger generation really wanting to work that hard 
to step into the life they dream of. They want to. They don't. Why not? I put it to all my high school kids this way. The average high school kid spends four hours a day on social media. TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. I don't think they do Facebook. Um, Four hours a day. So I tell all my high school kids, if you just took an hour away and repurposed that somewhere else, mental, emotional, physical work, you are literally separating yourself from the competition just by one hour a day. And even putting it to them in that sense, it's hard for them to be like, oh, but I got to go do the work. Right. And like, yeah, you have to. Like, and so it's really just helping them just get there to that point where they see that the work is starting to pay off. And hopefully that propels them. You know, I always say, give me motion before emotion. Like, I don't want to hear what I want about anything. Give me consistent motion before emotion. And then we can kind of come back and regroup and see what, what's happening. There, 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 there's so many things that, that, that we could mine in this conversation. There's, there's so much that you are bringing to people that just play need it. Again, they don't even know what they need very often at that young teenage they. They do want to be the new TikToker. They do want to do, be the new YouTube buzz, but they don't know what they really need beyond all that. And again, I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing, investing in the future that they even don't even know they're going to have. And what does that do for you when you lay down your head and you think about that? Do you think about, I'm literally planting seeds in something that will sprout, like you said, years after I know them, see them? Yeah, I mean, you know, to to continuously have relationships with players that I've trained well after they're done, I I get invited to their wedding, you know, we stay in touch, they care about my kids, we've all grown up together in some sense. Yeah. I I just had a college kid, you know, last month, you know, send me a a, a note saying, "Man, like I had a I had an assignment in class that I had to Write about somebody who reminds me of the word resiliency and you were it. You know, so these things, they, they, they mean a lot. And, and I, I wholeheartedly enjoy what I do and I love what I do. And I always, you know, I want to be the coach that maybe I never had. And I think that's been a really good way for me to think about it. That mm-hmm. way I don't get caught up in anything other than keeping that focus on that person and that individual and that family. But it's the same thing when I talk to, you know, adults and I and I ask them about, you know, their life and their, what are your priorities and how are you designing your day? And, the, you know, what's the reputation that you have in your office? You know, it, it's a cliche, but, you know, doors always open. But like, there's a lot of doors that are closed in an office because that innate leadership and that innate mentorship is not ingrained in everybody. No, uh-uh. Or... When someone does walk in their office and they sit down and go, I just got the most horrific news in the world. Are you going to push the work calendar aside, right. close the door and say, tell me, and literally lock in on that person. Nothing else matters. Because as you just said, most likely the calendar is going to run us, isn't it? Uh-huh. You're, you're, you're bringing back an old movie for me, Robert Redford, for the love of the game. Mm-hmm. Who's the pitcher? Yeah. And the crowd is going nuts. And he has this thing in his mind. He says, engage the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the crowd fades out and it's him and the catcher alone. The baseball skills of doing that. You were a pitcher. You Mm -hmm. you were a batter. You played first base of everything is gone. Did that help you to do the focus you needed to do? when life hit the fan for you? Eventually, yes. Once I, once, once I realized that it was, I had to take over, yes. Because I'll give you a perfect example. I have to work out six days a week. I have to. It's just, it's for my mental, but also physically. I just, I have to. I have to stay ahead of this. Yeah. And so it got to the point where 
I am the system. I have become the system. Not the environment around me dictates my system. So it's not like, well, I'm home. This is great. Well, oh, we go on vacation. Now I'm a different person. No, we go out of town for the weekend and, you know, now I'm a different person. Like, no, no, no. I'm the system. Wherever I am, that's where I am. And the environment, it just happens to be sunnier, colder, darker, left, you know, West Coast, East Coast, whatever it is. We got to the point where it didn't matter where we were. My workouts were scheduled for the week. So whether we're in St. Martin, I know what I'm doing. If we go somewhere else, before we get there, I have already Googled the gyms. I Googled what time they're open. We're already there, man. So it got to the point where people used to ask me, oh, wait, you're going to the gym? <laughs> now it's, how was your workout? That's a home run right there. That's a great way, great way to land this baby today. Chris Wasami, again, cancer warrior, but here's your website. What's exactly are people going to find when they hit that QR code and go scan it and learn more about Chris? You'll find out a little bit more about my story. Um, you'll see the things that I enjoy. You'll see the things that I'm, you know, I'm blessed to, to be able to do. Uh, that's VasamiTraining.com. My nutrition website is VasamiMethod.com. And just the ability to, to, to take all the darkness that I've dealt with, learn from it. And I tell people, if, if the catastrophe in my life helps you better your life and helps you prepare for the catastrophe that could possibly hit you one day, then it was all worth it. Chris, I'm curious, your husband, your, your father, your former professional baseball player, you're a coach and influencer, you're a cancer and thyroid fighter. Who are you? I am somebody who understands that life is really what you end up making it. And I'm somebody who, you know, luckily has the ability to still be here, still get up every day, still make the choice to get out of bed and honor those people who maybe don't get that choice. And I really truly believe that, you know, kindness, I, I, I hope it's normal. Showing love is, is normal. And look, Rich, at the end of the day, when, when it's all over for me, I, I just want to be able to answer three questions. Did I love, was I loved, and did I make a difference? Chris Fasami, thanks for taking the time to be with you here on Rock to Stay. It's been a pleasure. And somewhere, I think we'll find a way to get you on back here once again. <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. Chris Fasami, great to have him here again. Go to his website, learn more about him. He, he's coaching, he's influenced, he's about nutrition, and he's a cancer warrior. I love that he's still in the fight. This is like he says, not one of those things that goes away. Learn more about Chris, and uh, again, come on back. These are the conversations we're having on Rock the Stage. Highly unscripted, highly personal. We go beyond the story, deeper in the story, and it's an honor to have guests like Chris just open up and share for the benefit of everyone that tunes in and watches. And we love doing this every week. And it's all made possible by our great sponsors, Adavita Studios is helping to make the sponsors every week. They're with us and they're going to take your podcast, your audio book, help you distribute it to the market. And they're going to help you connect your voice to the world. Adavita studios.com. Learn more about Adavita and suspiciously convenient studios just over the border in Canada. Our good friends are helping you produce your TV shows and helping you make your movies, your films. If you have a creative idea, if you've always dreamed of doing it, get in touch with Suspiciously Convenient Productions, and maybe, just maybe, it may come to life for you. And that's going to do it for this week on the Trigger Rich Bonsai. We'll join us once again Sunday nights for our premiere parties. We want you to join us, engage in the live conversation, ask questions, get to know other people that are on the same journey, and watching amazing stories like this. Discussions. They're not interviews. We're discussing on Rock the Stage Show. We'll see you here on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time for our next edition of Rock the Stage Show. Until then, have a great week. And I think as Chris would probably be telling you, step up to the plate, take a swing, and have a fun time doing it.